honor of introducing Mircea today because I'm the only member of his committee who was able to be here, even though I'm the least important member. Uh, so I think one, one of the most exciting developments in, uh, in the last uh, decade, I think, that, well, what's been going on here when John Bonner was here for a long time, is the ability to view microbial interactions, especially the evolution of those interactions, in, a, uh, in an ecological context. And um, especially interesting is when there's conflict between individual cells and collectives to which they belong, and how things become self-organized, what the conflicts are between individuals uh, and, and the good of, uh, <coughs> of, of the group, and the relationship to multicellularity. So those are all big questions, and Mircea Davidescu uh, decided to take on that problem, and he put together a team that can, uh, consisted of uh, Ian Cousin, his, hello Ian, uh, his major professor, especially his expertise in collective phenomena, uh, and Karina Carnita, and her interest and expertise in multicellularity, and Thomas Greger, whose laboratory was well set up to, to do the sorts of experiments that he could put together a theory. And he took an obscure group, many of you may know a great deal about it, the Placozoa, uh, which most of us didn't know anything about before, but hopefully by the end of the day, uh, we'll know a lot more. Uh, Mircea tackled that, put all those things together in his thesis on complexity and scaling in simple multicellular animals, but he means in a particular simple multicellular animal, the, the Placozoa. So um, I've had the pleasure of reading his thesis, and now I'd like to listen to what he tells about it. So, congratulations. As mentioned, I would like to talk to you today about the evolution of multicellularity and what we can learn about this evolutionary transition from the perspective of collective behavior, focusing on a particular early diverged multicellular animal. Multicellularity is an important evolutionary transition because it is extremely prolific in the world around us, in numerous biological taxa having evolved uh, on numerous occasions. And the reason why multicellularity is so prolific is because there are many advantages uh, to this evolutionary transition. By becoming multicellular, organisms can become bigger and thereby escape their predator, as these unicellular algae have done by clumping together and becoming bigger than their unicellular uh, predators. Yeah. Multicellularity also enables the division of labor among cells. As you can see in this spherical Volvox algae, um, there are smaller cells on the outside of this algae that have specialized for motility and larger cells on the inside that have specialized for reproduction. There are also emergent advantages to multicellularity and these include things like improved sensing and decision making. In an experiment done on cell clusters that were tracking a chemical gradient, what was found was that when these cells grouped together in larger clusters, they could actually use the whole cluster body as a sensor and thereby improve their fidelity in tracking this gradient. The crux of this, however, is that these advantages typically require a lot of coordination. We usually take these for granted because, because we have a lot of adaptations that enable coordination at scale, such as a central nervous system and uh, fixed anatomies. But this was not always the case. And I want to focus particularly on the animal tree of life. And in particular, on the earliest diverged multicellular animals. These animals are quite different from us in ways that make the coordination problem uh, more challenging. One difference is that they have colonial body plans in the sense that they are of indeterminate size and indeterminate geometry. And this is an obvious um, problem for coordinating highly integrated movements and behaviors. Another difference between such animals and us, for instance, is that they do not have a nervous system, and in fact they don't have any neurons at all. This is important because it's believed that neurons and the nervous system are what enable animals to have directed and specific responses to stimuli. For instance, one of these peripheral sponges, if it were attacked, might be able to detect that it's being attacked, but would not know from where and thereby elicit a uh, proper escape behavior. 
I want to focus, however, on one particular phylum, the Placozoa, which I believe are able to, well, which I contend are able to resolve a very important uh, coordination problem in spite of these limitations. And that important coordination problem is motility. These animals must navigate their environments, hunting for their algal, algal prey, in spite of not having a head, not having a nervous system, not having any muscles or any fixed body plan. They're just a pancake of cells uh, drifting around on the bottom of the ocean. And not only do they have to move with such a uh, decentralized organization, but they can do so very intelligently. In work that I did with a, senior, with a former uh, undergraduate here, Leah Worthington, as part of her senior thesis, we demonstrated that Placozoa are able to perform chemotaxis towards a target, such as a food pellet, which they would never be able to find if it were um, just, say, like a dummy target at that same distance. This brings to mind, for me, uh, the words of Galileo, which are that even though the animal looks like this, it still moves, or and yet it moves. <laughs> um, and not only does it move, but it moves under a, a wide variety of um, sizes. So here I just am illustrating two different extreme sizes of this animal to give you a sense of the coordination problem at stake and how the rules that uh, enable this coordination must be able to operate across such a diverse size spectrum. Thankfully, there have been many advances in the field of collective behavior that have shown us how other decentralized systems are able to make decisions <coughs> and um, essentially to decide where to go. And my contention is that we can take the principles, the general principles discovered in these other systems and use them to elucidate the mechanisms at work in enabling an organism like Placozoa to also coordinate and make movement decisions. One such idea that has recently become a fairly hot topic in the field is the idea of self-organized criticality uh, enabling coordination and being adaptive for coordination. There have been a number of papers uh, recently in this field, including uh, some from the Cousin Lab, that have uh, looked at this phenomenon in these other animal groups. And I will, my contention is that I want to see if this is also a phenomenon at play uh, with the Placozoa. In order to explain what I mean by self-organized criticality, I want to start very generally and then uh, work my way down more specifically to the Placozoa. Generally, we know that nature is not static, nor is it just a chaotic mess, but instead it exhibits um, phenomena that could be described as complex. These include things like fractal patterns, power law scaling, uh, Zipf's law, and 1 over F noise. As an example of that, we all should be... Oh, we did lose the game, yes. Welcome back, Ian. We saw the right. <laughs> <laughs> Collect Collective decision making. <laughs> We emergently found the source. <laughs> so, as an example of a complex phenomenon, of a, such a complex phenomenon in nature, we can think about, say, the extinction rate of species over time. Whereas this is the percentage extinction. If we look at this signal over time, it's clearly a very complex signal with fluctuations at varying scales year by year. And what's interesting is that if you were to take these fluctuations and you plot out the distribution of their sizes, they often follow uh, what is called a power law. So what this means is that the probability of seeing a fluctuation of size s can be related to that size s by this mathematical equation with some negative exponent. And these power laws are found all throughout nature in things, in phenomena including earthquakes, where we have the Richter scale that uh, tells us approximately that an earthquake that's 10 times as powerful as another earthquake would occur 10 times as rarely. But we also see this in other phenomena such as uh, the size of forest fires, uh, solar flares, and many other uh, systems. One interesting thing that we've learned from uh, the realm of physics is that these types of uh, complex phenomena tend to occur when a system is at criticality. And that means that when it is at a critical manifold that separates two different phases of, uh, of collective behavior. 
Now, the question is, of course, is this criticality at work in these natural phenomena? And, I mean, it seems pretty unlikely starting out that, you know, all these natural systems are somehow on this very small uh, manifold here. So what's responsible for driving these systems to criticality? Especially when no one can uh, really control an external parameter, like you and I could say if we wanted to boil a pot of water, we could control the temperature. No one can do that to natural systems, so what could be at play here? One potential explanation that was championed by uh, Per Bach is the idea of self-organized criticality, which is that, that critical manifold, which I described earlier, is actually an attractor in the system's dynamics. So the system drives itself naturally and spontaneously to the critical point. The canonical example of self-organized criticality is the sand pile model. So imagine you have a sand pile to which you're adding grains of sand. And if the sand pile is too shallow and you're adding grains of sand, the sand pile will become steeper and steeper. But if it becomes too steep, adding more sand triggers these avalanches that cause the pile to become shallower. And the sand pile eventually stabilizes at a slope, which is called the critical slope, or angle of repose. And what's interesting is that if you simulate these sand piles and you measure the size of these avalanches, they occur at a variety of scales. And in fact, if you measure the probability of a certain size of avalanche, uh, you find that it actually follows the same sort of power law. So this indicates to us that the sand pile has just pushed itself by its own dynamics to a critical state. This has become a very um, attractive theory for the potential to find criticality in other natural systems and even in biological systems, where we can think about um, parameters that say govern biological function or collective behavior in biology as driving themselves spontaneously to a similar critical point. Not only could we think that, critic that systems could adapt to criticality, but some, like especially uh, Stuart Kaufman, have argued that criticality itself could be uh, <coughs> adaptive to a system. And in particular, this is inspired by work that was also done earlier, that, for instance, by Langton on these uh, one-dimensional cellular automata, which Langton um, perturbed, and then he measured how long this perturbation persisted throughout time in, in, in the system. And what he found was that uh, the perturbation persisted the longest in the system when it was tuned to a critical point, which he argued that uh, signified that a critical system is the best able to preserve information that's injected into it and perform computations on it. More recently, we've actually found that information processing systems in nature show these signatures of criticality. For instance, if we look at the firing rate of neurons in the retina, uh, what we find is that there are a few neurons that, um, that fire quite frequently and many neurons that actually fire relatively rarely, following this power law and, or Zipf's law in this case. Given that there seem to be these signatures of criticality in, in other natural systems, I ask whether such a principle could also explain how an animal like Placozoa is able to uh, coordinate in its movement decisions across this wide size range. In order to investigate uh, criticality in this animal, one of the first things that we can look for are phase transitions. What we know from other, st other uh, studies of collective behavior in other systems is that there are indeed phases of collective motion in these systems. For instance, if we consider cell clusters that are bunched together, there are random phases of motion where these cells are kind of pulling in every which direction. There are running phases where these cells are moving together in a highly polarized fashion. And then there are rotational phases where they are sort of spinning in place. And we see this also in fish schools uh, with some pioneering work done in the cousin lab here. Not only do we see these phases, but earlier simulations also demonstrated that we could drive a collectively moving system from one phase to, the, to another by tuning parameters, uh, as, you might, as was done, for instance, in these other critical systems. So, for instance, um, in Tomasz Wiczek, Tomasz Wiczek and collaborators created a model of self-propelled particles, particles flying through space that interact with one another by having a tendency to align. And what he found was that if you have low noise in this tendency to align, the particles flying with one another, you get this highly polarized movement over at the left end of this graph. 
But as you inject more noise, you can drive the system through a phase transition into very disordered motion. And Ian Cousin and collaborators have also demonstrated a similar phase transition in another computational model, but here the parameter that was being tuned was the range of interaction. So these phase transitions do exist in collective systems, and we can cross them by tuning parameters. The question is, do these exist in Placozoa, and are Placozoa actually poised at a phase transition at a, uh, a critical manifold? In order to do this, I measured the cellular dynamics within uh, different Placozoa ind individuals using light field microscopy, and of course I can't see the individual cells here, but what I can do is I can use a technology called optical flow to produce these nice vector fields on top of the animal that recapitulate the animal's motion uh, at any instant in time. And here's just a snapshot of those velocity fields, but if you look dynamically, this is a color map version of the same velocity fields. I can do this for every single frame of the animal's motion and recapitulate and quantify the internal dynamics within different Placozoa individuals. Now that I have this quantification, I can start to look for uh, order and phase transitions. Thankfully, there has been a lot of previous work that has tried to uh, quantify collective order in these moving systems, uh, work done by Ian Cousin, Tomasz Vicek, and others. One such order parameter is polarization, which measures the tendency of uh, these particles to align with one another and move in the same direction. Another is rotation, which is like a measure of the angular momentum of a collectively moving system. And then there is dilatation, which is what, to what extent this collective system is expanding or contracting in a coordinated um, way. My uh, advance on this was to combine these measures into a single unified um, order parameter. And the reason I did this was because, as you could see in the previous video, the internal dynamics of the animal are quite complex. It's not always very polarized, it sometimes it's rotating, but these states tend to be mutually exclusive. You can't move in a very polarized fashion and spin in place at the same time. So what I do is I create this unified order parameter to be able to quantify to what extent the animal is moving as a ordered crystal through space, or to what extent is it deviating from this type of ordered uh, movement. One um, hypothesis of what we can think of how the system behaves at a phase transition, especially in this type of collective movement, is that as systems would increase in size, as demonstrated in, in Thomas Fichek's example, um, we would expect the collective order to decrease at the phase transition. And of course, it's, this is actually what I find in the Placozoa. Here, uh, I'm plotting the animals by their diameter uh, on the bottom, and then I have their mean collective order measured, and there is a pretty um, significant a uh, downward trend of collective order with animal size. So this is one piece of evidence that suggests that maybe we're at this phase transition. But what about some other evidence? Well, another sub more subtle signature of this phase transition, uh, especially in these second order phase transitions um, that are more continuous and, and smooth, is that we would expect in a larger system, uh, the phase transition will have this steeper relationship with the control parameter, like directional noise, in this case. Um, and this is a, a finite size scaling effect in, in physics. It's the fact that the system is not infinitely big. Are these um, log scales? These? No, they're just regular scales. So the order parameter, sorry, the order parameter is bound between 0 and 1. Um, so, oh, you mean the... the well, I think you identify these straight line portions. Oh. Uh, the power law sort of things, which would be characteristic of power, of, of, of log scales. Ah, uh, um, in this case, this is not this is not log scale. It's not so it's, it's not not in this case. Uh, here we just have a collective order that spans from zero to one. Ah, uh, the linear scale. So, well, what I can do is I can look for this uh, the steepness of the phase transition, and of course, in the simulation, you can tune this directional noise parameter or any parameter that you want to try to map out the space. But I have no such control in Placozoa. However, I can assume that the noise within an animal is likely to vary dynamically. And furthermore, I can uh, get a measure that's a proxy for this noise by looking at 
uh, the amount of kinetic energy that's going into not this like ordered state of motion, but these velocity fluctuations. And what I mean by fluctuations is consider that you have these full velocity fields. These are just snapshots of two different animals uh, moving through space. And instead, um, what you have is you can decompose these velocity fields into a collective component, which defines this very ordered crystal-like um, movement. And whatever is left over, once you can take that into account, is the fluctuations in the movement. So how does this deviate from a perfect crystal flying through space? Um, and there are some equations that define how I subtract these collective um, like aff affine movements like translation, rotation, and dilatation. Um, but I, I won't go into the details here. We can, uh, they're in the thesis and I'm happy to discuss them afterward. The point is that I can extract these UI velocity fluctuations for every, um, every cell or every grid uh, space in this animal. So now that we have this extracted, just as a reminder of our hypothesis, uh, I was expecting that uh, the, this, en this noise, this energy, um, that's a proxy for noise, will have a steeper relationship with the collective order in larger animals. And what I find is, in fact, just such a relation. Here I have the uh, linear fits for all the different, um, for, for all the different uh, animals of different sizes. And if you plot their slopes against the size, you see this <coughs> decay whereby the bigger animals have more negative or steeper relationships. So this is uh, another sort of signature that we can look for that's a bit more subtle. Another signature would be to look for, as Simon mentioned, these scale-free uh, phenomena, these scale-free correlations. In other collectively moving systems, what has typically been analyzed were the, were the correlations spatially of these velocity fluctuations. So looking in space and comparing two different fluctuation vectors, we can measure how correlated they are by this normalized dot product. What I do is I measure the average pairwise correlation um, at different spatial distances r, producing a correlation profile CR for every single animal. And then I ask how does this correlation profile change with animal size? So in a case of scale-free correlation, we might expect that uh, we would expect that as the system grows in size, uh, these, uh, pro these correlation profiles will stretch outward with distance as well. And Ideally, they will all collapse onto a single functional form if you were to somehow normalize these profiles, say, by their zero intercept point. And this has been found also in a variety of other collectively moving systems, from bacterial swarms to flocks of birds. When I do the same type of measurement in Placozoa, I find that these correlation profiles do in fact stretch further outward with the system size, um, and if I were to try to quantify this, say, by mapping out the zero intercept, which is also referred to in the literature as the correlation length, um, and I plot this correlation length against the animal diameter, I find that there is this very significant linear relationship. So this is, in effect, the signature that we have these scale-free correlations. Um, just for completeness, I can also find a similar pattern, not just in the velocity fluctuations, but looking at directional uh, fluctuations, so where every cell is, is moving uh, just in orientation, and also in fluctuations of speed. Uh, so it's not dependent on a specific measure that I used. As I mentioned earlier, this result matches what we know and what we've discovered in other collectively moving systems, ranging from flocks of birds to studies on schools of fish that were performed in the Cousin Lab to bacterial swarms. All of these collectively moving systems seem to show this um, linear scaling of the correlation length with the system size. But there is one complicating factor, which is that in all these systems that I mentioned earlier, the goal, or what was demonstrated, was that you could take all the correlation profiles for different sized systems, and by, say, dividing the pairwise distance between vectors by their zero intercept correlation length, uh, what was found was that for these systems, you could collapse their correlation functions onto a single invariant correlation profile. And this shows that 
larger um, systems essentially behave the same as their smaller counterparts. They're just rescale versions. Uh, and you see this in starling flocks, as demonstrated by Andrea Cavagna's group, in bacterial swarms, called Chen et al. Uh, but you actually don't see this in Placozoa. In fact, when I do the same sort of rescaling, the correlation profiles do not fall onto each other at all. And what looks like is happening is that correlations are decaying proportionally at a faster rate in larger animals. They seem somehow less correlated, less important. <laughs> I quantify this effect by looking at the cumulative correlation of these profiles, uh, which was, de was demonstrated by Atanasi et al. from uh, Drea Cavagna's group that this is a proxy for the susceptibility of the system, and this reflects how sensitive the system is to perturbations, how likely it is to cause those avalanches uh, of changes in behavior that I sort of talked about earlier. When I do this for Placozoa, I find that the susceptibility scales sublinearly, suggesting that in bigger animals, they are less susceptible to perturbations and, in effect, have more behavioral inertia. It's less likely that there will be a big cascade of behavior that changes the, the entire animal's uh, movement. The question is, as you probably all ask me, is why are Placozoa different from other collectively moving systems? In fact, the evidence I've shown seems to suggest that in Placozoa, or these uh, simple multicellular organisms, coordination is somehow worse than in moving atom groups. And there are some theories that I have for why this was the case. One, if we think about these simple multicellular systems, they're actually more constrained versions of collective movement than moving animal groups. And what we can think about is that if you imagine a flock of birds flying through space, these birds have all sorts of um, degrees of freedom, you might say, that they can compress themselves, and the flock can expand and stay together, uh, birds can swap neighbors and drift throughout the flock, uh, and this uh, is, is uh, argued by others to be important for sharing information within the flock. Of course, within a multicellular sheep, you don't really have that freedom because cells are tightly constrained on one another and often are impeded from changing neighbors, from uh, large-scale compressions and expansions. Another important difference is network structure between these two systems. It was, it was demonstrated in the Cousin Lab, for instance, uh, that fish schools have very complex networks of interactions with clustering that enables one fish, say, to uh, affect the behavior of many different neighbors. And it's been argued that this sort of complex uh, network structure is, is responsible for the ability to drive uh, system-wide changes in behavior or, or information propagation. And this was also argued for bird flocks and for the, the V-check model of collective movement that I, I looked at earlier. We find these complex network structures. Of course, if you take a look back at the multicellular sheet, this image is actually from the Trichoplax adherence, the animal I study. Um, as you can see, those cells are arrayed on a Voronoi network largely interacting with each other only locally, and therefore you can't get these complex networks that could help with information propagation. In order to put this, uh, this theory to the test, I teamed up with a collaborator, Pavel Romanchuk, who is now a principal investigator at Humboldt University, uh, and we decided to simulate Placozoa. Our simulations were elastic sheets of self-propelled particles. These are again these particles that try to move through space, and they're connected to one another on a Voronoi network of springs. And what these particles do is they pull on each other and they have a tendency to align to the mean of the forces that they experience from their neighbors. So that's how you know, directional information is propagated in this elastic network, if you will. Their alignment is also with some sort of noise uh, that's gassing. Of course, what's, what's interesting is that we can actually tune many of the parameters for these simulations to match the placozoa, such as the cell speed or cell sizes, and we finally recapitulate many of the emergent phenomena, like spontaneous polarization, rotation, um, and many other modes of collective movement that we notice in the actual placozoa. The interactions are between the Yes. With the, with, the with, with, the placozoa, with the simulations? Yes. Only mechanically through the forces. And the noise is 
the noise is on the orientation of the, the new direction that each cell takes. Yeah, good question. Um, we did do some additional simulations where we tested variations of this, and we find that we largely recapitulate the same phenomena even with these variations. Uh, as, I'd be happy to elaborate on that later. The next thing that I mentioned about simulations is that you can now start tuning parameters um, and look and seeing how the system behaves as you're changing uh, these various parameters. As an example, we can look at this uh, directional noise for the different cells on the springs, the different particles, and we can again drive the system from a very polarized, ordered state that you see there in the left-hand side of this graph. We can add more noise to this alignment behavior and then drive the system to a critical point where you see this order phase transition and you have these uh, interesting animals with large correlated domains on the inside. And then you can actually add more noise and get what's essentially like an epileptic placozoa that's just randomly perturbing itself continuously. Um, but the point is that we can actually use this to now ask which of these three different cases best recapitulates the phenomena that we see in placozoa. Why? So why do they order the lower rotational noise? Like if I randomly set them up all point of different ways and oh. I set the noise to zero. This is the only understanding why they because their alignment is through, uh, it's they align with each other through this, but by, by the, they take their new direction based on the mean of the sum of forces they experience from the springs. So you get this spontaneous alignment that's relatively similar. So the motility mechanism is actually feeling the forces. Yes. Yeah. Well. Okay. So you put it. Um, of sort. I mean. It's, yeah, I would say it's, it's not as explicit as in, say, the V-check model. I mean, this is based on a different um, Moving back to our question, <laughs> which of these three systems best matches uh, what we observe in Placozoa in this triple class? For instance, if we look at the correlation length um, or the susceptibility measures, um, for systems with different noise parameters, here shown in different colors, what we see is that in the low noise case or in the critical noise case, you have, again, this sort of linear scaling of the correlation length and this um, by and large scaling with the, 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 the susceptibility. But if you go to the high noise case, you see that there is this attenuation of the correlation length. Um, and therefore, we can conclude that the high noise case does not actually match what we observe empirically. We can also look, for instance, at the collective order in the system and, and try to see um, how system size affects uh, the relationship <coughs> between noise and order. So this is going back to that argument I posed earlier from uh, the V-check model of collective behavior. And what I find is that well, first, it's only at the phase transition that you see this uh, wide range of order. You don't see size effect collective order um, in, say, the low noise case. But also, if you even look at the subtle effect of the slope of the relation between noise and order, uh, you have a steeper relationship between um, in, in larger systems than in, than in smaller systems. And you see the same sort of slope plot uh, here that I was showing earlier. So. To me, this suggests that the only parameters regime that recapitulates uh, our empirical results are the, is, is the critical noise regime and not the low noise regime. As a conclusion for this section, what I find is that placozoa exhibit phenomena characteristic of a moving system tuned to criticality. But being at criticality in such a decentralized uh, multicellular sheet, creates um, problems for maintaining collective order. And we saw this size effect on collective order within the placozoa, even at their relatively small sizes of 10,000 cells or so. We can then imagine how this phenomenon could affect this, a decentralized system that, say, is the size of a human being, which is orders of magnitude bigger in cell count. These results suggest that as animals were evolutionarily driven to become bigger for the advantages that I mentioned earlier, there was a need to coordinate at these larger sizes 
And this suggests that you can't get this done in a decentralized fashion. And instead, you need um, to evolve hierarchical systems of coordination, such as a central nervous system. That's all well and good for coordination, but now I want to relate this to um, ecological function in Placozoa. And one particularly important ecological function that I think we can all agree on is reproduction. In Placozoa, reproduction occurs through <coughs> asexual fission. You have one animal that uh, sort of elongates and constricts itself and then divides into two uh, different animals through this vegetative fission process. And ever since I first learned about this process, I was curious, what is driving this process mechanistically? Is it, for instance, that these animals fission because of some developmental regulation maybe triggered by metabolism, or could this actually be an emergent phenomenon of a lack of coordination at larger sizes? And as an example of what sort of fueled my analysis, well, my, my hypothesis for this was that when I was doing those chemotaxis experiments, I noticed that sometimes very large animals would actually produce this type of fission, which looks, to my eyes, as though there is a coordination problem across this animal. Of course, I wanted to test this in a scenario that was not so artificial like a chemotaxis trial. Uh, so I actually grew animals in different nutrient conditions. Uh, some animals grown in with, with richer nutrients than others. And when I start with animals of the same size in, in both conditions, and I let them grow for a period of uh, a couple of days, what I find is that animals in richer conditions grow to significantly bigger sizes, which could argue, okay, it seems intuitive. <laughs> but what is perhaps not intuitive is that between these two conditions, you uh, actually do not see an increase in the number of individuals that are produced, these asexual rabbits. Instead, um, they seem to grow uh, following the same sort of growth curve uh, between both conditions. And this to me was surprising. So I, I asked, what could be the, the mechanism at work? Is it that these animals, for instance, are growing faster in richer conditions, but are also delaying their fission uh, at larger sizes? Um, it, it was not clear from this type of aggregate data. So I looked at it instead at an individual level, what, what was going on. One uh, measure that we can look for is growth. So I can look at animals of a certain initial size, and then I can ask, for a given environmental nutrient condition, how do the animals grow um, after a period of 24 hours? How much growth, what is their final size? What I find is that the growth is highly predictable based on just these two pieces of information. The regression is actually uh, quite convincing for both conditions. More interestingly than just the final size is, of course, the, the growth amount, which gives you a sense of the productivity, the biomass productivity of each individual which is a good proxy for fitness in such a clonal organism. What we see here is quite interesting. First, in the 0.2 uh, concentration nutrient condition, the low nutrient case, what we see is that there seems to be this metabolic attenuation of growth, whereby even though animals could be, say, three times as big as another animal, the amount of biomass that is produced by that animal is relatively the same. However, if we put them in rich nutrient conditions, What's interesting is that we don't see this attenuation at all. In fact, the growth line essentially follows the one-to-one uh, -one line that we see um, above this line. So it, it, it's parallel to it in terms of the slope. And this tells us that bigger animals are just as efficient at producing more biomass as smaller animals in these, um, new, in these nutrient conditions. So there's no metabolic attenuation in one condition, and there is metabolic attenuation in another condition. And yet, when I compare the two uh, different conditions for their fission, uh, their the propensity to fission of different animals, what I find is that animals um, tend to never fission below a certain size, so shown here in red when they're really small. And when they get bigger, they seem to have a propensity to almost always fission um, above that, that threshold size. And that you can look at this also statistically by, for instance, plotting a logistic model of whether an animal will fission in 24 hours based on the animal's initial size. Um, there's admittedly uh, a lot of uh, uh, a substantially big error bar there, but the models pretty much fall on top of each other. This to me suggests that fission is not 
metabolically regulated. It's not driven uh, by some internal regulation, but instead it could very likely be an emergent phenomenon of um, simply growing to a bigger size and a problem to coordinate. I wanted to look at this phenomenon mechanistically as well. Um, and then we start to ask what were the, the things that, that vary systematically with organism size? What, what could be driving this vision? One obvious candidate is the shape of an animal. When we see different placozoa individuals, I mentioned that they have a very large size variation. Um, when they're very small, they form these very disc-like structures, highly circular, and as they get bigger, their shape becomes more and more complex, more elongated. Um, and I wanted to see whether this is a systematic allometry and see whether this is driving this vision phenomenon that we see. To quantify shape in such a uh, amorphous amoeboid animal, if you will, um, I can't use landmarks, but what I can use are, are, are shape factors uh, of the animal. So shape factors are non-dimensional measures of shape that uh, relate different sort of quantities. So as an example, you could look at circularity, which relates um, area and perimeter, and the circularity of a perfect circle is one, and any shape that's not a perfect circle is less than one, all the way down to zero. Uh, you can also look at a thing like waviness, which relates the perimeter of a shape to the perimeter of the convex hull of that shape, and um, being, and this waviness value, reflects the complexity of the boundaries, or how wavy the boundary is. What I find is that for these measures, they tend to vary uh, systematically with animal size. Here I'm just plotting a number of different measures with uh, just a lowest regression, just to show the sort of systematic trends. Um, but I wanted to go dig a little deeper, so I did a principal component analysis on these shape measures. And what I find is that I can actually explain 90% of shape variation in these placozoa just by two different principal components. Uh, these are the only significant principal components. And the principal components are themselves quite intuitive. The first principal component, I know this font is a bit hard to read, but this principal component is simply um, the measures that show the animal's elongation or aspect ratio or you know, the sort of anisotropy in growth along one length versus another. Um, and the second uh, principal component is a measure of the boundary complexity. So how is this deviating from, say, a circular shape or like a more oval shape? Are there you know, indentations in the animal? Things like that. When I look at these two principal component <laughs> shape measures, what I find is that they vary systematically with the animal size. Um, and there is a significant relationship uh, with size for both principal components and uh, a relatively decent uh, r square value for them, given that these are just mean values for, for animals, for very different animals. Of course, what I want to look at in the future is whether this type of shape allometry <coughs> impacts that sort of um, fission dynamic that we saw earlier, whereby smaller animals are not fissioning and bigger animals do fission. Is, is shape related to coordination and is that driving these fission dynamics? To investigate this question in the future, uh, I'm collaborating with one of Ian's new students uh, in Germany, in Konstanz, Frederick Novak, who has uh, taken up the mantle of studying placozoa and placozoa behavior. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, to yeah, trying to answer this question. In conclusion, uh, I wanted to make this a bit uh, memorable because I know we've covered a lot of ground and we've talked about a lot of different terms that maybe people have heard for the first time. And I think the best way to make this memorable is to try to paraphrase uh, the Gettysburg Address with my conclusion. I'm sure that will help this stick in people's minds. Um, so the first thing that I think we can all agree on is that the first multicellular animals were these decentralized simple organisms. Three score times ten million years ago, our ancestors brought forth a new organism conceived in collective behavior. But placozoa, well, when we look at these organisms, the placozoa, they show phenomena that indicate tuning to, to criticality. They are dedicated to parameters such that all fluctuations are scale-free. 
Being at criticality, however, creates a trade-off between increasing in size and remaining in coordinate, this sort of order size uh, relationship that I mentioned earlier. So now it is engaged in a great coordination struggle, testing whether that animal or any animal so conceived can long endure. And this coordination trade-off, uh, I've provided some evidence that it seems to indicate that as animals increase in size, it creates this emergent phenomenon of fission uh, at larger sizes, that it's not metabolically driven. And this fission is important because it allows for coordination of the cells, by the cells, and for the cells to not perish from this earth and reproduce. Uh, those are my conclusions. Uh, before I finish, I would like to acknowledge the many important people that have played a tremendous role in my development as a scientist here. Uh, first and foremost are my advisors, Ian Cousin and Karina Tarnita. Um, Ian has given me possibly the, the greatest gift that an advisor could give a student, which is the freedom and the means to pursue whatever question I was interested in, whether it was a new system for the lab or not. Uh, Karina, I'm very grateful for the many meetings of, of dedicated attention to finding the interesting questions in the system that I was studying. I would like to thank Simon, who is here in person, and... <laughs> And who, uh, through our discussions, has really given me a life-changing perspective on um, how to pursue science, how to think about big questions in, in new systems. And I'd like to thank Tomas Greger, who so graciously hosted me in his lab and gave me the infrastructure and facilities to uh, pursue these questions. As collaborators, I want to thank Paolo Romancho, especially, uh, who helped tremendously with those simulations to solve a critical question in Plakozoa. And uh, I'd like to thank, as well, Nir Gaw and Shashi Tutupali, who are now at the Weizmann Institute and in, uh, in India, and they, are, they, are, they provide very fruitful discussions as well to guide my um, knowledge of this large, like heavily physics-oriented uh, thesis. Of course, uh, I'd be remiss to not mention the group, the lab members that I've had the pleasure to work with, the Cousin Lab and the Gregor Lab, and especially the Cousin Lab members who are still uh, with us uh, at Princeton. <laughs> that <laughs> that sound good. <laughs> the Cousin Lab members are still in Princeton. <laughs> uh, and finally, for funding, I would like to thank um, Ensor and the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department for really giving me the means to support myself throughout this endeavor and enabling my scientific research. So I have a heavy debt to this department, for sure. Of course, I would like to thank the Placazoa that have signaled their lives for this research. On a personal level, I would like to thank the many friends that uh, I've met here at Princeton and that have come actually to my, my meeting here in spite of the weather. Uh, including my friends from the department, who have been a tremendous uh, source of energy for me, especially my cohort, many of whom are here, either in person or remotely as well. Um, friends from Canada, from the Taiwanese students group that inducted me uh, in, as an honorary member, though I'm not Taiwanese, but okay. Um, and also Ian and members of, of our lab, who Ian especially, I think, does a, a, a great, um, puts forth a great effort to not only be a mentor to his students, but also a friend, and I've really appreciated that over the years. Finally, I want to thank all the graduate students that gave me the opportunity to serve uh, as the president of the graduate student <laughs> government here, uh, and try to both literally and figuratively hold high the standard of the graduate school. On a personal note, I would be remiss not to thank my family, especially my mother, who is also here in person today. Uh, and my mother, Mihaila Javier, has been a continuous inspiration for me. Um, that's why I wouldn't be here today. My older brother, George, who I've always looked up to, sometimes literally when I was younger. Uh, and a special note for my uh, girlfriend, Sophia, who has been a tremendous source of energy, support, and uh, just a driving force in my time here at Princeton, and I could not imagine going through this experience, but I couldn't imagine this experience with, without her, and I'm really appreciative of that. That all being said, I'm now open for questions. Thank you for your
Richard, thank you for your far-reaching presentation. I'm going to save most of my questions for later, but I wanted to take issue just with one point and see if you really meant what you said, which was, and it's kind of orthogonal to the main theme here, but when you were talking about uh, self-organized criticality at the sample example, you said to reach the a critical mm -hmm. angle. But in fact, I don't think that's what's going on in self-organized criticality, because otherwise the avalanches would always be the same size. And, and so it'll, sometimes it builds up bigger and crashes, sometimes it builds up smaller and crashes. So self-organized criticality is more of a dynamic process by which uh, uh, you, you, may, you may oscillate around at some critical threshold, but you don't always get back and stabilize at that threshold. Yes, yes, I, I might have misspoken when I, when I said that. What I meant was that, uh, as I mentioned earlier by, in, in the text of the slide, it's more of this attractor in the system's dynamics that you will sort of right. oscillate around this point. Um, but not that the, the slope is you know, fixed and immotile this whole time. Yes. Right. So I'll save the rest of later. Most of the questions now should come anyway from students and others who will not be in, in the grill that will come afterwards. Matt? Um, so, uh, I have a question about the, um, like the group size and fishing thing. Like, do you ever look at, like, you know, say five minutes prior to a fish event, like what the order parameter looked like? Is it that they're just really disordered or there's something that you can kind of predict that, oh yeah, the fish event is going to occur soon? Uh huh. Well, there's a challenge with that, and that is, um, if I back up a bit to this vision, um, just to demonstrate the challenge is that the fission event, I mean, I, I sort of showed snapshots of it, but what you can see in this image here is that it actually is a process that lasts, can, can go on for quite some time because this animal is pulling itself apart. Um, so I, I agree with you that it's a, it's a very interesting um, mechanistic way to look at this, um, but it's often it's quite difficult to get the type of resolution to look at the internal dynamics for the times that you were trying to observe this animal throughout the fission process. Um, it's really very much uh, unpredictable, I would say, in, in terms of the, like, whether the animal will fission while I'm recording it, unless I record it for a really long time, like 24 hours. But definitely, I think we can probably um, approach this question of newer systems being developed in, in Constance at the Mount Planck Institute with Frederick. Yes, Daniel. Hey, Richard, I have a few questions for you. So, um uh, first, um, you had this like linear relationship between correlation length and order parameters. You said it's indicative of the parameter gap, right? Uh, correlation length and the order parameter. Yeah. Yeah, I mean there are two different sort of indicators. Yes. Yeah. Um, so like, if you were in like a subcritical or supercritical regime, like what would you expect? That like, I, I hope that it wouldn't be linear. What would you expect it to look like? You mean the, the slope or which one? Just like the curve, right? You have these order. Okay. So let's take an example of the, like, well, well, so as an example of some of these parameters, oh, like the, the order parameters that I had, yeah. the order would be extremely low. So you can, for instance, see the order parameters here. And for instance, maybe you could say that in the high noise case, uh, as you're going out, you can still see like the size trend with the order, that, that order is decreasing with size. But um, I would argue that at this point, you're not seeing those uh, correlation length indicators that we had uh, in this high noise case. In, other, in the, the low noise case, the systems look pretty much identical in terms of their collective order. Um, so th that's sort of how, how I would expect that to look. Like, they would look, the size should not have an effect in the low noise case. And maybe there's a subtle effect in the high noise case, but there are other observer tools I use to build that out. Okay, so basically what you're saying then is that in the low noise case, I'm going to see a linear relationship, but there's going to be certain no evidence of correlation. The no points are going to lie in sort of horizontal or vertical line. Um, and then in the high noise case, I'm going to see or I'm going to see sort of a very weak correlation. Yeah, very low correlation lengths. And that's actually what happens when we simulate at high noise, we can measure the correlation profiles. And I mean it's basically like you see here, they're not these any sort of big correlated domains of this epileptic uh, placozoa, and instead it's just like, it's noise. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Fernando. Uh, you mentioned that, well, uh, as you're 
as your animals uh, grow larger, uh, the domains are smaller in proportion to the size uh, of the animal. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, that could make these animals have a larger inertia in their movement. Mm -hmm. uh, do, they, do they actually uh, maintain a direction for more time? Do they actually spin for longer? I haven't quantified this phenomenon, but what I can say anecdotally is that it does appear to be the case. For instance, um, there are certain behaviors that I find which are um, which are like this, like a, a, a sort of like a circular exploration. And what I find is that actually in very large animals, this behavior can persist for hours even, whereas in smaller animals, uh, they tend to drift in and out of different states of collective movement. So I think. We can quantify, for instance, the persistent times of, say, order parameters or like a persistence in the centroid's direction of movement and get at that question. I, I definitely have the data to look at that for sure. I just haven't had the time to look at it. Yeah. And uh, if you incorporated like the ability for these springs or models to break above a certain force threshold, do you think you'd get similar patterns of when fission occurs as you do in your observational studies? This is an extremely interesting question, and I don't have the information to uh, answer it, but it's definitely something worth um, pursuing, I agree. I actually have thought about looking at it, maybe not even in this dynamical sense, but just looking at uh, changing this network structure. For instance, I have these elastic sheets. What happens if we were to constrain the middle and we have like two sort of lobes connected by a small bridge? How would that change the uh, coordination and the correlation structure within the sheet? Um, there are definitely like a lot of ways that we can pursue this with the simulations. And I think looking at it dynamically as well, whether it causes fission, I think it'd be very interesting if we could simulate that process. So I'm going to, one of the examiners has to leave uh, shortly after three. So I'm going to ask all graduate faculty to remain behind so we can uh, tease uh, Mircea with a few questions. And the rest of you, uh, hopefully we can meet uh, in a little while over in Eno Hall. So thank you very much. Mircea.